Hi guys, it's Stephen here. Um, feeling quite embarrassed about what I'm about to say, I think. Feeling a bit silly. But never mind, here goes, and if I'm stupid, I'm stupid. I've been thinking about several things recently. The first thing is that how happy I'm feeling. I've been feeling sort of happy for several days now, several weeks. And for me, that's quite an unusual feeling. And I think it's got a lot to do with freedom. Freedom from guilt, because as many of you know, I've stopped <coughs> worrying about God or thinking about God in the sense of the Christian concept of God or any other organised religion. I'm not atheist, but I'm agnostic, I think. I still spend time in prayer because I'm a great believer in the power of positive thinking and of thoughts. But the other thing is the pipe. Smoking's given me a freedom that I didn't think I needed or had. Whenever I smoke, I'm beginning to feel quite bubbly inside, quite happy. Which lasts when I don't smoke, so as I say, I've been feeling quite happy recently. The odd thing is that I think it's something to do about my attitude to the pipe. Not just the idea of smoking tobacco, that's important, the taste and the, the, the way we load the pipe, all the rituals that go with it, and the pleasure that a good blend of tobacco gives me. Gives me. And I suppose gives all of us, otherwise we wouldn't smoke. But for me the pipe's much more than that. Um, I'm smoking my Nording long sort of hobbit pipe, as I call it. And uh, in it I've got some Stokerby um, coils, coiled flake. I should have brought it outside so I could have given you the proper name or whatever. But for me the pipes become to mean something else, to, to have something else. It's There's the meditative side of it, the contemplative side of it, the deep thinking and the relaxation, which I think a lot of us feel, that our minds can just drift away in thought and we can do all sorts of other things maybe, but always in the back of our mind there's the pipe. smoke and how it rises and how it feels in the mouth or in retrohaling. But the Pope's taken on a mystical side for me.
It almost feels as if when I'm smoking, I'm going into another place. Um, as if there's a, and I, this is where I struggle because I'm quite worried, by it, quite embarrassed by it, but it, it's almost a sacred feel about it. That smoking a pipe has a sacred aspect, has a feeling of almost holiness. And I don't mean in a Christian sense or in a, um, a religious sense, it's deeper than that. It's as if the pipe puts me in touch with um, my soul, my something within me. And I wanted to sort of say something about it just to see whether anybody else feels that about pipes and smoking or if I'm the only one. Another thing that it's been, that I've been thinking of because people have been mentioning it in some um, videos is how life progresses. You know, we looked at the things as children and we moved on from there. I think it was something that Joshua of the Woods um, said in his latest video. And to see the how the pipe means so much to him and to, to all of us, the fact that he's now able to smoke again, I looked at the latest video and it just looked right. It looked as if he was where he should be, doing what he should be. And I recognise that we can't all smoke, we can't all, you know, with some of us, illness stops us. But that made me sort of think of the end of life. Even if we've got a faith in a religious belief, the doctrines of that religious belief are um, there for us um, as a hope, as a, a feeling that when we die, we go on somewhere. Now, I don't necessarily have that, but it doesn't worry me, the idea of dying. That doesn't mean I want to pop off any time soon. After all, I'm only 68, and I rather hope that I'm going to make 100. Not because I think there's anything special about that, but it would be rather nice to see August the 3rd when I'm 100, my birthday. So what does death mean to me? I'm not afraid of death at the moment. I wonder what the process is going to be like. You know, that time just before the end. I'd like to feel that I died in bed, surrounded by my concubines and my pipe and, you know, the family who's looking after the shop, you know, and that kind of thing. But for me, death is the price we pay for having life. Now, I know for a lot of people life's not good, that it's 
full of fear, full of terror. You know, if you think of those war zones and the children and the innocent bystanders. If you think of the soldiers who bravely go forward and put their life on the line for us. And those on the other side who put their lives on the line. But I don't think my life's meant to be like that. I think my life's meant to be enjoyed. <coughs> Sorry about that, I nearly choked. But, you know, life's meant to be happy. Somebody said, how do we count success? I'm not sure success is important. We, Carolyn and I, managed to get by on a, a very reduced pension and what little the state gives us. And sometimes we struggle, that's why I haven't thought of putting up a 200 um, giveaway. But supposing I'd was a successful business or that I'd made money in other ways that I didn't, you know, have to worry about money. What's that got to do with life? You know, I can't take it with me. What I can take with me, I hope, There are memories of my friends and family and all the books I've read, all the knowledge that I gained. Maybe that. But very little else, if that. I know people who work for all their life some of them because they enjoy it, and that's okay. The ones I worry about. Are the people who work all the hours that God gives. They are mentioned God, and I don't believe in him. Um, but all the, hour that, all the hours that they've got. All the hour pressures that the firm puts on them. I bet when they die, or come close to death, they're not going to say, oh, I wish I'd have spent more time at the office. I wish I'd have spent more time working. I worked hard at times when I was, went, worked in the mill pushing two ton rolls of paper around and lifting a 600 pounds iron bar with a crane at one end and me at the other and my job was to push that bar into a roll of paper when I was a vicar I put in 60 hours a week and took upon myself the pain and fear that others had. And it seemed that I was able to do that. I remember once going to visit somebody in hospital and before I could get to see them, this nurse grabbed me and said, are you a priest? And I said, yes, and she'd go in there opened the door, pushed me in, there was a man in bed dying. His daughter was crying at the foot of the bed. His wife was holding him and was hysterical. And his son was just totally gone. 
he was there with an oxygen mask on and he had that cold clammy sweat and I looked around and thought who do I go to first I went to the wife and talked to her and seemed to be able to bring her to a point where the hysterics had gone and that she had found some sort of peace and rest. Then I went to his daughter who was equally upset and prayed with her and laid hands on her. And then to the son and just explain quietly that this was a natural part of life, that his dad was going to die. And then to the man, and prayed with him and laid hands on him, with his permission. And then aware that I was late for this communion, that I was going to give this patient who was waiting for an operation and they were holding off until I got there to hear his confession because he wanted to make one so I left the room and a week later the rural dean rang me up he's like the official um, he tells you off when you've done slightly bad things and his boss the archdeacon comes in when it's legally bad things or when there's time and the rural dean said to me did you do go to the hospital last week and I said yeah and I said why and he said I've got a, received an odd letter today it's from a nurse at the hospital who wants to know what you did in that room and I said oh god it was it all messed up and she said no it's no it's when she went in there was absolute peace and the man died gently five minutes later with his family around him and everything was okay don't get me wrong I'm not saying what a wonderful man I was because when it got to the end of the week I was in tears and terrified of dying and Carolyn said well I'm not surprised you've done five funerals this week and you've been with two people who are dying and I had to find a way to get rid of that fear and I did eventually find a way but And smoking a pipe I've begun to feel at one with things at one with nature not that I've become a tree hugger or anything like that but just looking around me now and hearing the birds and the clouds and, and all those things that are out there watching 1972 woodsman making a cup of coffee in the woods with his little burner watching Joshua in the woods taking us to a place that was like Eden and thinking how different it was when I was worried about life I was worried about doing the right thing Sorry, I'm nearly choking on this pipe. Was worried about all those things that I should have been doing or should have done in life. And I sort of thought, you know, what's really 
going on. What's really important? Um, you know, and you think, what am I supposed to be doing? I wonder if any of you have felt that the pipe's giving you a that kind of freedom, that kind of rest. But there's a recognition of holiness both in yourself and in your connection with the pipe. You know, throughout history, smoking has been important to tribal people, to people in the First Nation in your country, and in other countries where they've smoked various things. For most of people, I suppose, pipes just a, a way of getting nicotine into their system, but this group seems to be different. We seem to have a care for each other. A bond of the pipe. I'd be interested to see what other people feel about it. Or whether I'm actually quite insane. The trouble with insanity is that you feel that you're normal. That um, in some way you're not mad. So I'm sorry if that has been a an odd video today. I was going to say if you turned off at the beginning or halfway through, that's all right. But of course, if you did that, you won't hear me saying that. If some of you have got there to the end, well, good for you. I'm going to finish with a joke. I don't feel uncomfortable about telling the kind of jokes I tell. There might be people who think that we shouldn't tell those kind of jokes. But my attitude is that life's full of fun. And if there's a funniness about it, it's not the rudeness or the corniness of the joke. It's that surprise at the end that makes us laugh. So, there's these two ladies talking, and it was one of the ladies' husband's birthday the week before. And her friend said to her, What did you finally find your husband for the birthday? And she bought him a magnifying glass, beautiful magnifying glass. And her friend says, what? And she says, yes, my husband asked for the best penis enlargement product available in the market as a gift. So I bought him a magnifying glass. <laughs>